Okay, let's get started. It's 10 uh, one So uh, we'll have other guests join in as well, but uh, let's let's get started. Um, so uh, welcome to uh, the second event of uh, the Connected Insights Web Summit. Uh, so as you all know, uh, you know we're doing this uh, series of webinars and panel discussions over the next seven days. Uh, it's called Connected Insights. My name is Varun Malik. I'm the CEO of, um, of Consolidon, which is a new age consulting firm where we make connections between consulting firms and their clients and clients and consulting firms. This is a slightly different structure of the traditional consulting firm. Um, together with, we have about 350 small boutique consulting firms in our ecosystem. So together with about 70 uh, boutique consulting firms, we have, uh, and law firms with, with Connected Law, uh, we have uh, uh, curated this webinar, uh, webinar series and panel discussion series called Connected Insights. Um, uh, you know, 2020 was a was a, supposed to be a really great year, right? It was supposed to be the year that was going to change uh, a lot of destinies. It was, uh, it was uh, the turn of a new decade. It was very, very uh, natural to be extremely positive about, about this decade. Um, unfortunately, everyone knows things didn't turn out the way and, and they turned out the way they did. Um, so at Consolidon and at Connected Law, uh, and I'm, I'm sure Priyasha will introduce Connected Law, but at Consolidon and Connected Law, we always wanted to do a few things that, uh, you know, can help the economy get back, right? And in fact, one of the things that we do is 20% uh, of the time of all the consultants at uh, Consolidon is spent on uh, initiatives like this, right? So we started off the Superheroes project last year. The Superheroes project was a project where we got 700 business leaders from all over the Middle East to come in and uh, support, uh, in that case, businesses get back on track because obviously, you know, there was a huge shock uh, in April and May of 2020. So we uh, tried to help businesses get back. Uh, this year, what we decided to do was set up this summit. Uh, so here we all are. Today's discussion uh, led by Priyasha is uh, a legal blueprint for an e-commerce business. Um, so Priyasha and I met a couple of years ago uh, at, uh, and we collaborated to set up a legal startup, uh, which was into legal education, but about a year and a half, a year ago now, uh, we decided to set up a, just like Consolidon, the new age consulting firm, we decided to set up a new age law firm called Connected Law. Um, so before Priyasha begins, I will just, uh, one quick note, uh, housekeeping notes is that, um, we will be promoting all the attendees to panelists so that you can share your videos, you can uh, interact freely, you can ask questions, unmute yourself, etc. And throughout this, uh, uh, you know, throughout the uh, webinar, we will have several uh, giveaways, right? So on the chat, without interrupting the interrupting the flow of Priyasha's talk, uh, we will have a few giveaways. Uh, which, uh, so for example, first, uh, you know, I've talked a bit about the Superheroes Project. We'll just send a quick invite on how you can be a mentor to help small businesses in the Superheroes Project. Uh, after about 15 minutes, uh, we're going to, we're doing about six workshops uh, be, uh, between 5 p.m. and 8 p.m. Dubai time from today till the end of the summit. So we're doing six workshops. Uh, we're giving away, uh, of course, those are paid workshops because they're longer workshops. So we're giving away invites to three people if you fill up a short form. So we're just giving you a quick uh, invite uh, if, if you'd like, of course. Uh, so we're just going to paste that. Um, we'd love to invite a lot of you to be speakers because Connected Insights is something that we're going to keep doing over the next few, uh, next few months at least. Um, so we'd like to invite some of you to be speakers. So we'd send out a short form, uh, which you can fill if you'd like to be a speaker. And, um, uh, you know, at the end of the webinar, we're going to do this uh, photo. So for that time, uh, you know, I just ask you, uh, each of you, if, you're, if you don't mind, switch on your video so that we can, we can do a quick photo for social media and uh, to tell everyone what a great time we 
had here today, if that's okay. Um, so that's broadly it from me. Sorry for taking a little bit longer than I promised I would, Priyasha, but uh, over, over to you. Uh, no problems, Varun. Thank you very much for the introduction. In fact, you covered most of the housekeeping matters that I would have anyways mentioned and taken up, you know, the first few minutes. Um, so anyways, uh, first of all, a welcome again to all of you to the Connected Insights Web Summit and to today's webinar on legal blueprint uh, to launch and run your e-commerce business. Now, I'm super excited to have all of you in here for today's session. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, there's going to be a lot of value packed into today's session. And so it would be great if you could engage with me, with me to, uh, you know, during the course of the session. Um, I'm going to try and address some of your questions during the course of the presentation. But if I don't, then I will definitely take it up uh, towards the end during our Q&A session. Um, so yeah, I'll tell, uh, I'm actually going to now start my presentation and I will then also give you a quick introduction to myself. Let me share my screen. Okay. So a little bit about myself before, uh, you know, we get started with the meat of the presentation. My name is Priyasha Khoury and I'm a co-founder and partner at Connected Law. As Varun just mentioned, uh, Connected Law is essentially the legal advisory arm of Consolidon. And we're essentially a new age law firm and we connect clients with senior lawyers with the relevant expertise. Um, so I'm a, I've been practicing for about for over 10 years in the MENA and India region. Um, I also have a legal edutech app myself. Uh, I founded this app called QLTS Geek, and we're actually now in the process of rebranding ourselves. So, uh, you know, we're, we're in a little bit of a flux at the moment, uh, but I've gotten I've learned a lot of insights as well about, you know, running an e-commerce business while uh, running uh, my application. I enjoy working with a lot of online businesses, startups, and e-commerce companies. And I'm going to quickly tell you a little bit about, uh, you know, my work with e-commerce companies. I'd love to connect with all of you on LinkedIn or via email. Uh, so yeah, looking forward to today's session where I get to know all of you better. In fact, I probably did, should have mentioned this earlier, but uh, yeah, it would be great if you could also introduce yourselves in uh, in the chat function. We'll all get to know each other more and uh, always good to see where everyone's joining from. Uh, so a little bit about, uh, you know, the e-commerce companies that I've worked with. Uh, I've worked with a lot of B2C companies like Swan. Uh, Swan is a grocery delivery application. Uh, worked with a with with a, with a company which sells cars that sees. Uh, there's of course uh, Edu Fikra, which is uh, Muna, the founder. She's actually on this call as well. <laughs> then I've also worked with a couple of B two B companies, uh, just working on their contracts and disputes. Uh, so working with all of these companies, including, you know, uh, the e-commerce company that I run, I've gotten a lot of insights in terms of, uh, you know, how, uh, in terms of the legal aspects of e-commerce, the, the issues that e-commerce companies face. So I'm actually quite excited to share all of my insights with you today. I've also worked with a lot of big brands, and I think this has essentially help me understand the best practices when it comes to drafting contracts, as well as preventing and avoiding and resolving disputes. Um, so a little bit about uh, what I will cover today. So today I'm gonna to be covering the key options for setting up your e-commerce company in the world, as well as the UAE. A second, I'm going to be talking about uh, choosing your activities, uh, how to choose your activities. Then of course, I'm gonna be giving you a little bit of insights about what are the popular payment gateways, um, what are the IP considerations and protections that you need to be thinking about. And of course, finally, I'm gonna be talking about the key contractual documentation that all of you uh, would potentially require for your company. 
I can see the chat. Thanks a lot for uh, introducing yourself. Another thing that I would also be interested to know is whether you do have an e-commerce company at the moment or whether you know, you're in the process of launching one because it'll be just good for me to get those insights uh, you know, in terms of uh, whether you already have a company or whether you're looking to set up one. So yeah, please feel free to share that in the chat box as well. And if you do, then yes, we uh, we you'd probably find a few customers during the session. Okay, so let's get started with what are the options for setting up your legal entity. I think this is a question that every founder goes through, and the question is, where do you set up? It's, it can be quite confusing, especially if you're in the UAE, because you have a plethora of options. And I think the issue that most founders face is a choice paralysis. Too many options, uh, you need to weigh the pros and cons, and it's not really, not, not really easy to come to a decision in terms of where to set up your legal entity. Well, the thing is that any serious business does need to have a legal entity. You could start, uh, Come, you know, you could start a business without uh, an entity, but if you're looking to have a serious business, you always have to start with, um, you know, a legal entity to house your business. Um, and I think this is also complicated uh, by the fact that there is no one size fit all answer when it comes to setting up your business. Uh, you know, even though I've been advising companies for so many years, I mean, founders for so many years on, you know, where to set up. It, there's no one answer that I can give to any person. In fact, I like to sit down with a person, understand their objectives, understand their business objectives. Uh, and only then after a little while, I can sort of understand what could potentially be good options for a founder. So it's pretty much like, you know, peeling the layers of an onion, like, you know, you have to peel the layers to actually understand, to get to the core of what could actually be a good setup for your business. Uh, I mean, I myself, I spent quite a long time uh, trying to understand and researching the various options that I had to set up an entity. And there are so many considerations that come into play. Well, I guess the first thing that you might want to do when looking to set up your business is uh, you need to ask yourself, what really is your business? Um, is it a marketplace? Are you going to be like an Amazon where you're an intermediary and you're not really, really the seller? Uh, of course, Amazon is also, uh, also is now like they also sell on the Amazon platform, but there are a lot of uh, applications and marketplaces where the, what, what the, the founders provide is essentially a platform. And then, you know, different buyers and sellers can actually come to the platform and, pitch and, and, you know, uh, carry on the transaction. Um, another thing that uh, you also need to look into is, are you physically trading your goods? Now, there are a lot of businesses, they're already trading companies, and then they actually decide to launch an e-commerce application. So in that case, they probably already have an entity, and so they might not really need a new entity to set up their business. Um, another question, I mean, another factor is, are you uh, a drop shipping business? Uh, a lot of e-commerce uh, companies these days are drop shipping businesses, which is, uh, you know, they, they don't really stock the products that they need to sell. They're only, they market the products. And as and when, uh, you know, somebody places an order for a product, they ask the seller to ship the goods to the buyer. So this is actually quite a profitable business. And I, I know a lot of people who are actually into drop shipping. Here again, it's, uh, if, you, if you're setting up a drop shipping business, you have uh, easier options to set up and, and you don't really have to worry about the logistics. Um, another question to ask yourself is, who are you marketing the app to? Uh, and that's also going to determine your uh, the best, uh, the best jurisdiction to set up your entity. I know it's uh, the picture is still unclear, but uh, as we move along, you'll probably get a few more insights in terms of what could be a good entity for your business. Uh, so you have two key options when it comes to setting up your legal entity. 
you have certain international options or you could choose to set up in the UAE. Now to give you a very broad thumb rule, if you're intending to market your product primarily in the UAE, then essentially you would have to set up an entity in the UAE. However, if your business is something which, if you, if you have, if your business caters to clients across the world, then you can essentially consider an international entity. So the key options for setting up a company internationally are, you can choose Stripe Atlas or one of its competitors. Uh, Stripe Atlas has, uh, helps you set up a company in Delaware in the US. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about it uh, later in my presentation. You could choose to set up a company in your home country if that makes it easier. There are a few offshore locations as well, which used to be popular like BVI, the Panama, Cayman Islands, and now not so much, but essentially these are your key international options if you're looking to, uh, if, if you're looking for an, if you're looking for an international option. Now uh, in the UAE, you do have a few interesting options as well. There's the DED trader. You also can set up your company onshore or you can set up your company in a free zone. So these are your broad options and I'm gonna quickly get into a little bit of the details. Now I've, met, I've talked about Stripe Atlas. Now Stripe Atlas is essentially a product of a payment gateway company called Stripe. So what Stripe Atlas does is that you get to set up your business online and you also get a bank account in the US. And all of this is just for $500. So it's actually one of really the cheapest international options out there. And it's quite convenient because you get access to a payment gateway. So you can actually start collecting payments from your clients. And uh, you know, if you're if you're if you're an early stage startup, then you don't really have too much of a tax implication in the U in, in the U.S. And so there's no uh, key issues with being based out of the U.S. But of course, having said that, once your business grows, once let's say your you know your business your revenues cross let's say hundred two hundred thousand dollars or even more or, or maybe even five hundred thousand dollars, then you can actually start considering other options to you know, move your business. So in fact, I've uh, set up my legal education app in Stripe Atlas. Um, I had, you know, I, I took some time to, to arrive at this decision. I didn't want to set up in the UAE because I just felt like it was a bit expensive. And I felt like, okay, $500 a year sounds, sounds pretty reasonable for me. And, and that's how I set up my entity at Stripe Atlas. Now, uh, you could also set up an entity in your home country uh, because of course you're providing an online service. So essentially the world, you, you know, you can set up your company anywhere in the world. And sometimes it does help to, set, to have an entity in your home country. Uh, that said, there are a couple of things that you need to think about. Um, you need to think about the tax considerations. There could be certain tax considerations if you're based out, based in your home country. It's not like in the UAE. In the UAE, you don't really have to think about tax, uh, but with other countries, you know, there's a tax regime. So setting up uh, in other countries could be, uh, you know, could be complicated from a tax perspective. Uh, the second thing is you could also have foreign exchange restrictions. So I was also considering setting up my, let's say company in India, which is my home country. But, you know, I realized that there were a lot of foreign exchange restrictions, uh, even with PayPal and all the payment gateways, they were not really functioning completely. Uh, they don't function completely in India. And so I decided that, okay, you know, maybe it doesn't make sense. And of course, you know, it, it, it was not really that cheap as well. And then of course, uh, you know, the question that you need to ask yourself is who are you marketing the app to? Now, in my case, uh, you know, my clients were all over the world and not particularly the UAE. I wasn't really focusing on the UAE. Uh, so it made sense for me to set up my company in let's say Stripe Atlas, uh, with, with Stripe Atlas because uh, I wasn't specifically marketing to the UAE. 
But if you're specific, specifically marketing to the UAE, then what happens is you sort of need to think about an entity here because that's that's how you can legally conduct business in 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 this country. Uh, there are a lot of offshore locations as well that used to be popular. You know, countries like uh, the BVI, Cayman Island, uh, the Panama. Uh, the only issue with those um, offshore locations is that one is they're actually not that cheap. They would at least cost you about you know three thousand to four four thousand dollars to set up, and also with the new economic substance regulations, it's it's become a little complicated to be based out of those jurisdictions because if you don't have a business in those jurisdictions, then there's a lot of reporting and compliances that you need to take care of, and 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 that actually makes it sort of complicated to be to consider offshore locations these days. Now, actually, uh, now we'll actually talk about uh, some of the options in the UAE. Now, uh, in the UAE, actually, the most cost effective is the DED trader license. It's quite a good option if you're just about, if you're a very early stage startup and you're just testing the waters, I think the DED trader license is great. Uh, you actually get to get this license for about 1,500 dirhams, which is very reasonable. Um, you need to be a resident in the UAE uh, to actually avail this facility. Um, and this, and the, the, DD, the DD has essentially come up with this license for online businesses. So you, if you look at the activities on the website, the DED Trader website, you'll see a lot of activities which cater to e-commerce companies. Um, and of course, the, there's just a couple of drawbacks, like I said, uh, one is uh, you don't really get to have a limited liability company with the DED trader. So the options that the DED provides you is to set up a sole proprietorship or I believe a civil company. Now, um, the issue with the a sole proprietorship or a sole trader company is that you don't really um, enjoy limited liability. So with companies, with limited liability companies, you're, as a shareholder, you're sort of protected from uh, liabilities associated with your business, but that's not the case with a sole trader license. With, with the sole trader license, uh, you become personally liable for let's say any debts or liabilities of the company. Uh, having said that, uh, you know, um, uh, you, you know, when you're just setting up your company, you're probably not really the, 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 the probability of you having liabilities is quite low. Also, a lot of uh, when you're just starting out, you tend to have very small ticket products. And a lot of, you know, a lot of people who take the DED trader license have small ticket products. Uh, so it's very, uh, it's very unlikely that you would face a huge liability. Uh, let's say you have a client who's not quite happy with your product, you can always provide them a refund, or you can provide them with extra credits. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's very likely that you're going to have somebody come behind you when you sell a product which is not really high ticket product. So I think the DED trader license makes sense if you're testing the waters, if you have a product which is not really high ticket and and you, you, you're looking for a really cost-effective option. You know, you could, always, you could also always start with the DED trader license, and then when your business grows, you can consider a company. Now, of course, the DED trader license, like I said, is not really an option that works for everybody. Uh, it, you know, you can't really get a visa sponsored under this license. Also, if you want to have multiple shareholders, I doubt the DED trader doesn't really allow you that option. So then you might have to consider different options. Um, there is the option of setting up an onshore or a mainland entity as well. Uh, but this is not, again, suitable for all cases. Uh, this works when you have a physical trading business and you don't want to deal with, you know, a commercial agent. Um, 
so if you if, if you're trading in goods if you want if you're actually importing goods into the uae then you might want to consider an onshore company now um, the issue with an onshore company is again you don't really have you don't have the option of 100 percent local uh, foreign ownership uh, 51 percent uh, of your company will have to be given to a local that said, we all are aware that uh, the laws in the UAE have changed and uh, effective from the end of March, uh, we're expecting that you can actually set up a 100% onshore company. The only issue is that we're actually waiting for the government to come out with more updates on uh, on, the, on how the 100% foreign ownership is going to work. So the T's and C's of the new law is going to be really important. Uh, we're still waiting for updates and, uh, but yeah, I mean, we're close to the end of March. So yeah, I mean, if, if we do reach, uh, I mean, I think if we have 100% local foreign ownership in onshore companies, that's pretty much going to be um, a game changer. So I hope that, uh, I mean, I hope I've not been rushing through and, and I hope that there are not too many questions. Uh, I'm not sure if I can see the chat screen. Yeah, I think I can. Perfect. All right, yeah, I can see a couple of, I can see a couple of uh, comments on the economic substance regulations. Yes, I know a lot of people are not too happy about it, but well, you know, um, it's it's part of complying with KYC and AML regulations. Yes, in fact, uh, you yeah, with onshore entities again, you can also do you can have a hundred percent owned company. Again, the only issue is that you typically only have the option of setting up a, a sole proprietor proprietorship again, a sole trader or you can set up a civil company. Um, now, again, like the issue with these options are that um, you don't have limited liability. And as a lawyer, I always like to say that it's, it's good to have limited liability, um, you know, especially when your business grows, you, you, you wanna make sure that you enjoy those benefit, the benefits of limited liability. Uh, and which is why I think when it comes to e-commerce companies, uh, free zones are pretty much a good option to set up your business. You're not, most e-commerce companies don't physically trade in goods. And even if you are physically trading in goods, you can actually appoint a third party logistic provider to deal with things like custom clearing for the, you know, for getting your, for importing your goods into the UAE, or even to ship the goods to your customers. Um, so, uh, and also if you're providing a service, then well, it, it's a no brainer, you definitely need to, you definitely should consider a free zone. Uh, there are a lot of offers from free zone is in the Northern Emirates. So yeah, it's always good to look out for offers from the free zones in Sharjah, you know, Rack, Pajera, or even uh, Russell Kema. Uh, the only thing I would say when you're when you're setting up a company in a free zone is that uh, just you might want to just get a few clarifications before you set up. One is you want to make sure that uh, you need to understand what are your compliances. So try and clarify with them. Do you need to submit an annual audited accounts with the free zones? There are some free zones which don't require to, require you to submit an uh, audited account. So some people like that. So you might want to check that with your free zone as well. Um, also, make sure that you ask your free zone about the closure process, because some free zones, the closure process can be quite complicated. So if you've set up your company and you then need to close it down, uh, then you might have a little bit, you might be, you might face a little bit of an issue out there. So try and always check with the free zone on the closure process. process. Uh, but just to again, let you know, it shouldn't, it typically is not too complicated. Um, it's just that you would probably need to appoint a liquidator, get a report, uh, submit it to the free zone authority. Certain free zones I know make it very hard for you to close. So make sure so you know try and just get all of these clarifications before you set up your company in a free zone uh, priyasha i think dr tahir had a question 
Are you raising his oh, hand? Oh, sure, 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 perfect. Yeah, Thank sorry, you. I should have just raised it here, right? So no, no, it's a good time to actually address work. some questions because I, I, I realized that I've been talking a lot and uh, I'd, I'd fine, like yeah, to yeah. interact a bit. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, uh, yeah, so I think I had a very unique problem in the last five years, right? So uh, I'll tell you, it was, it was 2017 or 2018, wherein uh, I mean, I'm an independent consultant generally, you know, uh, consulting for, you know, a couple of billion dollar companies, but, uh, you know, and mostly in stealth mode. So, uh, you know, one of my clients in Philippines uh, did not want to work with a company in India. I mean, they had their own reasons, their funders mm -hmm. or whatever it is. So what I did is actually I, uh, you know, uh, asked my people who are actually going to deliver the company, uh, deliver the product actually, uh, to set up a company in Russell Kaima. And this was in 2018, right? Uh, now, that was one of the things which was a very tricky situation for me because I did not know how to set up a company. And although eventually the entire process was quite easy, you just go to this office in, in Dubai, the Russell Kaima office, and they were quite nice, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know if they have, finally closed that company because that project kind of finished uh, midway. Uh, the second problem I had, and I'm, I'm getting to my point actually, is that um, recently, I mean, back in 2019, I mean, 2020 is gone, right? So, but 2019, um, I was trying to consult for a company in the UK, uh, a mid-size uh, telco company, you know, telco kind of third-party company, uh -huh. uh, but they didn't want to do any business with a free zone company uh, in Hello? UAE or in the GCC. Hello. Hello. How are you? So uh, that was a tricky situation. And I think this is where my question comes in is that, uh, you know, because of the AML and because of how people set up companies in free zone, et cetera, et cetera, there is a certain reputation that has gone based mainly in the Europe uh, and some to some extent in the US is that those companies are not real, real companies. So my, my question is, you know, for me, I've had two tricky situations, uh, but how do you deal with this? And when you mentioned around Panama and all those other destinations, I mean, there is a set of dozen destinations that we don't want to go there because as soon as I tell my company is based in Panama, uh, it's already shady in the in the head of my client, right? Uh, and I think, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to some extent, this free zone companies have come in that radar. So how do you deal with this kind, that kind of a situation with, with a client who is going to pay you quite decent bucks? Uh, no, thanks a lot for sharing your experience, uh, Dr. Tahir. Um, well, in fact, this is the first time that I've actually heard of a case where, you know, a company, like a foreign company doesn't want to deal with a free zone company in the UAE. So, yeah, good to know that. Uh, well, I think, uh, you know, the last year, the last couple of years, the UAE has definitely been, you know, on the radar. You know, we, we've seen that, you know, for, for a few months, it was blacklisted by, you know, in, in some the yeah, articles, yeah, articles yeah, and yeah. all that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, in response to that, the UAE has taken a lot of steps over the last couple of years to actually comply with the AML KYC regulations and to and to make sure that, you know, uh, to the world, they do show themselves that they, they do take, uh, you know, these compliances seriously. And that's why a lot of regulations have been introduced over the last year. One is, uh, you know, the economic economics regulations, regulations, as well as... as well, uh, uh, as well as, uh, you know, ultimate beneficial ownership, uh, uh, you know, notifications. So there are all these steps uh, that the UAE has taken. And these uh, regulations are also applicable to UAE companies. So you do have to make all these filings with the, you know, registration authority in your free zone. So these are the steps that, uh, the, you know, uh, the government has taken to make sure that, you know, the reputation of all you know, free zones as well. Uh, I mean, of the UAE is sort of improved in the international sphere. Mm -hmm. okay, so I great. would say to that extent, you could always explain to your clients that, uh, you know, I am complying with all these new regulations introduced by the UAE. And that could potentially, that's one thing that you could do with, uh, with your that's clients. That's a great idea, actually. That's a great idea because what we yeah. can do is we can, 
make a list of like 15 20 things that yeah. this is what we are complying with and once they see that sheet then there is nothing to question i mean they can look at a uh, you know wall street journal or a new york times article or yeah. whatever it is but that's just an article here is the actual compliance so yeah yeah that's, that's and you a can, good one yeah yeah and you can make your reports as well your ultimate yeah. beneficial ownership reports and all of that and show it to them um, uh, and of course the ease of know, setting companies here priyasha what i've seen is it is so good right because i dealt with uh, you know again back end of 2019 i dealt with setting up a company in ireland uh, mm -hmm. wherein uh, you know it was not that easy i would say for anybody who is non european you know mm -hmm. it was very difficult in a, in a way it was difficult uh, but yeah no i think i got my answer i think you gave me a solution now thank you for yeah i have another tip for you in fact uh, to, in today's uh, you know in today's attendees we have uh, deepak bhavnani as well and i could probably connect you with him uh, after the session uh -huh. but he's a kyc he does kyc aml for companies and he can actually pre prepare a report for your company uh, mm -hmm. run a check for you and you can actually present this report to some of your clients who have any mm -hmm. concerns so you can always do like a vendor due, the, yeah. due diligence of sorts and presented to your client but just another question dr tahar just so that i understand is your company still active because i thought you mentioned that you were talking about closing it there was this client who set up i helped them set up the company but uh, i don't know they set up it in russell Hema in 2018 but obviously after the project because i do short-term projects right so yeah, yeah, i yeah. was with them so i was actually based out of philippines uh, for that duration of that uh, time I, I need see. to check with them because I kind of lost her. I mean, I got my money and I was out of it. Right? So, okay, okay. So, so I'm so a you, consultant. So I understand. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you, yeah. do you still have an entity in Rack or no? Uh, I'll have to check with them. It was their entity, not mine. I see. It was there. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. Perfect. So maybe, yeah. So I think uh, we've had a good, uh, you know, quick, break in terms of, yeah, a quick chat. <laughs> uh, let me quickly go over, you know, choosing, uh, how to choose your activities uh, i'm conscious of the time as well because i want to make sure that we have at least 15 minutes for the q a <laughs> okay perfect so when it comes to choosing your activities in the especially in the uae you want to make sure that you're choosing the right activities because that determines what you can do and what you can't so it's pretty it's relatively straightforward in free zones uh, in the uae because most free zones have e-commerce or marketplace as uh, an as an activity however if you're setting up in dubai with the dubai ded they actually don't have any e-com they don't have e-commerce as an activity but what they instead have is portal so portal is essentially an activity where you are an intermediary so you're not really selling the goods and services but you're in you provide the it platform for buyers and sellers to come together and carry out transactions digitally Another thing that you need to be thinking about is, are, are you going to be handling logistics? Because like, let's say, are you going to be delivering goods to your clients? Because if that's the case, then you might need some additional licenses like home delivery or uh, yeah, there are certain home delivery activities and you might need to actually have that. Uh, but like I said earlier, there are a lot of third party logistic service providers and I would recommend that you actually use them initially if you're setting up your company that that allows you to have a very simple license in in a free zone and you can you know outsource the headache of logistics with your third party logistic uh, providers and they anyways have the appropriate licenses to do the needful now, if you're a little confused about how to choose your activities, you can actually check the activities of your competitors or you know, companies which are similar to you. So how do you do that? Now, in the UAE, uh, there is a database of companies that the government has introduced uh, you know, recently, and it's called the National Economic Register. Uh, now you can actually, it's, it's an online portal where you can go and you can check the various licenses in the UAE. Uh, so, for example, let's say that you want to look up Zomato, you can actually go there, you can type Zomato, and then you will get, uh, you know, the list of all licenses of Zomato in the UAE. And what you can do is you can actually, let's say, click on the licenses, you can see the details, you can even actually see the manager in, in, many, in many times, and you can check out their activities. So, for example, in, in the case of Zomato, 
one of their activities is software house and internet content provider. And that makes it a lot of sense because what Zomato essentially is, it, it's only an IT platform. It, you know, it gets buyers, it gets restaurants and it, it gets clients to sign up to their system, but they're not really selling anything themselves. They're just a platform. So this is one thing that you could do, check out activities from, uh, you know, the companies which are similar to you. A quick note on payment gateways. Uh, you have a lot of new payment gateways that have come up in the UAE. I haven't personally used them, but uh, a lot of my clients have, and, and, you know, and I think uh, these are some of the good options that you can consider. There's Stellar, there's uh, CC Avenue, Amazon Payment Services, Paytabs, Hilobiz. So you actually have a lot of options before you these days. And I think, uh, you know, you wouldn't have to now worry about payment gateways in the UAE. A quick note about IP considerations and protections as well. Uh, now, you know, like I guess a question that a lot of founders also sort of ask them, uh, you know, face is how do I protect my brand? Now, this is definitely a, an important question to ask yourself, but I would always say that initially when you're just starting out, maybe you might not really need to protect your logo or your brand. Uh, the risk of, uh, you know, 90%, we all know 90% of startups anyways fail. So you don't want to be spending too much money on uh, logo protection. Uh, also bear in mind that trademark protection is quite expensive in the UAE. So you're spending at least, you're going to be spending at least about 12,000 dirhams if you want to trademark protection. So that's quite expensive. However, what you can consider, consider instead if you're just starting out is copyright protection. So it does protect certain artistic elements of your logo and you're probably only gonna to have to spend about $200 to get this protection and you would be protected uh, across at least over hundred countries. So copyright protection works differently from trademark. So with trademark, what you have to do is you have to register your trademark in each country, especially in the Middle East. Uh, you, at least the Europe has certain common, uh, you know, uh, protections. So if you're registered in, in let's say one country, you're protected across all the others. But that, uh, but in the in the Middle East, that that's not how it works. If you want protection in each country, you have to register, you have to file separate applications, and that can get quite expensive. Uh, that said, if you're a bit, of, if you're a slightly more mature startup, then you can actually consider, you can still consider trademark protection. And we were actually conducting a session later this week, and this is on Thursday. Uh, we have a couple of IP experts who are going to tell you a little bit about how to choose a brand name for your company, how to protect yourself in a very cost effective manner, and how you can how you can actually search for something that is unique and and unprotectable and and protectable for your uh, for your company's business. So I would really uh, I would urge you to attend that session if if this is something of interest to your business. So that is about protecting your logo and brand. Now, the more important thing when it comes to IP for you is to make sure that you have IP assignment clauses in all your contracts. So just to, get, to give you a little bit of an uh, overview, all the IP that you're creating for your company should belong to your should belong to the company. So for example, if you have asked a developer to develop an app for you, you need to make sure that the technology development contract between your company and the tech development company assigns the IP, the intellectual property of your application to your company. Because the issue is that if, if the intellectual property is with the tech development company, then they can essentially use your application or they can use the source code for another brand. They can set up their own company with pretty much uh, you know, uh, with pretty much whatever that you've asked them to build. So make sure that you have an IP assignment clause, all the IP, all IP related to your logo, source code, etc., should vest with your company. Also with all your employment contracts or even contracts with freelancers and consultants, make sure that all the IP uh, created via the agreement 
is assigned to your company. And that's very important. Uh, that's, that's one of the key things that you need to look for in all your contracts that you enter. That brings me to the key legal documents that you are going to encounter when dealing with your e-commerce startup. Now, the first thing is you're gonna to have to deal with the co-founders agreement. If you have multiple founders, it's very important to have a co-founders agreement. And the key reason to have this agreement is twofold. One is you wanna make sure that whatever that you've agreed with your co-founders, it's listed in a document. Even if it's not, to be honest, I, you know, sometimes I don't even care about enforceability sometimes because what happens is as human beings, we actually tend to forget what we've agreed upon. And that ha that's happened to me as well a lot of times. Uh, you know, I have, let's say I've entered into a contract with, uh, I've entered into some sort of an understanding with, let's say my, even like some of my acquaintances and friends for a business. But then a few months down the line, you actually forget what you've agreed upon. So it's very useful to have an agreement where you go back to, you have a look at that, you see what you've agreed upon. And then, you know, you can always have a constructive discussion uh, if, if you encounter any issues. Uh, of course, the second thing is a, agreement is also, uh, it protects you from any disputes. So, you know, if you have any disputes and it's, it's, it, it goes down a route where you have to actually go to the court, then, you know, you have, you have an agreement with certain written, with, with, which, which, which essentially protects yourself. Another agreement that you would commonly encounter is a sweat equity agreement, especially when you're a startup, uh, a lot of uh, consultants, uh, they, you're probably going to get them to do a lot of work for you, but you probably don't have the funds and so you would actually be giving them sweat equity. So it's very important again to record all of this in writing in a sweat, sweat equity agreement. Uh, you want to have a vesting schedule for all the for all the work that they've done. Uh, typically it's four years. So if somebody has worked for you and provided you services for four years, then they definitely should uh, enjoy a certain sweat equity. Uh, another agreement is an advisor agreement, uh, especially if you're a startup, then sometimes you might wanna, you know, you might want to get advice from a mentor and, you know, to repay your, the time of a mentor, you can actually have an advisor agreement where you give them a minor, a minor stake in your company. If you're looking for a good template for an advisor agreement, then I would suggest that you look at the Founders Institute. They have a really good template. You can just have, you just have to Google Founders Institute advisor agreement and you'll actually get a very good template that you can use for the advisors of your company. Uh, another key thing is our, uh, another key document is the terms and conditions for your website, as well as the pri privacy policy. It's very, this is a very important uh, document because you want to explain your business model in this document. So for example, if you're only an intermediary and you're not really a seller or the buyer of a, of a good, then you want to clarify that in your terms and conditions. So a lot of e-commerce companies, they will have this particular clause in their terms and conditions. They will mention that we're not the seller of the good and therefore uh, we're not a party to any contract between you as the buyer and the seller. We're only an intermediary and we're only liable if there's any issue with our platform. But if there's any issue with the goods that you've brought via the platform, then that's not our problem. Uh, so that's something that a lot of companies, you know, mention that in the terms and conditions. So this is how you also protect yourself from risks. Um, everybody who signs up to your website, they need to accept your terms and conditions. And so this is where you can actually make, uh, you can actually put a lot of clauses to mitigate your risks. Okay. Uh, a lot of contra uh, when you're also an e-commerce company, you would have to enter into a lot of contracts with vendors, especially if you're not selling the goods. And this is where, uh, you know, a practical insight that I can tell you is, uh, you know, you need to maximize the number of vendors in your platform. So if you have a contract which is slightly complicated, that's probably going to be counterproductive. 
So I would always say that uh, have a very simple contract, which is a one or a two or a three page agreement with the key commercial terms. So you can actually have something in the form of a table with the key commercial terms. And the rest of your clauses can be in the form of terms and conditions. So you can actually put the terms and conditions in your website and you can refer to those terms and conditions in your simple agreement. Uh, so essentially what that means is that from a perception perspective, uh, what the vendor sees is a very easy to read contract with just the key commercial terms and all the T's and C's, um, you know, all your um, detailed clauses, you can actually have it in, in an extra or in, like I said, in a terms and conditions that you can actually, you can, and you can put a link to that in your website. Now, uh, you know, one of the things about contracts is that uh, you need to think about the governing law sure. and the dispute resolution clause in your contract. Huh? That's very important. Uh, and what I would suggest is it's always good to have DIC laws and DIC quotes in all your contracts. Uh, the reason being no, is that, um, yeah, I think one of you might have to put yourself on mute. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. No. 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 No worries. But the key thing that I want to mention is that uh, with with DIC courts, if you have a dispute which is under five hundred thousand dirhams, then you can actually resolve. Employees who provide a medical report. What is medical report? Okay. Hi, Mona. I think you're. Uh, you need to put yourself on mute. As Mona, the doctor, ma taqwi. Um, um, okay, <laughs> okay, so I'm not sure who is uh, moderating the session, but if you can just put yourself on, uh, put <laughs> on mute. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, no worries. Okay, perfect. So, uh, yeah, with, like I said, with the DIFC laws and DIFC codes, what you can do is you can actually resolve your disputes without a lawyer. So if you have any disputes under 500,000 dirhams, all you need to do is you need to go to the court, say that I have a dispute, and uh, there's a judge, they try and settle the matter between the different parties. And you can actually explain yourself, both the parties can explain yourself, you don't need lawyers. Uh, and so I think this is, this is a very good way to, uh, you know, save on costs, legal costs. Uh, also, uh, you know, the DIFC courts follow the English common law system. So um, I, I think it's a lot more predictable and, uh, you know, you can protect yourself in many ways uh, if you are subject to the DIFC courts and if your contract is governed by DIFC laws. So yeah, that's in short, um, you know, uh, my presentation. I'm gonna address some of the questions uh, quickly. And I'm also gonna tell you a little bit about another course that I'm running in April, but I'll first address the questions. Okay, I see there's a banker in uh, in our attendees. So thank you for attending our session. I'm really happy to see you here. It's always good to have bankers. Uh, they're a very important part of the process because you do need to set up bank accounts. And okay. Okay, so we do have a comment from Victor Abu Rahal, and he mentioned that, you know, uh, you can have a service agent onshore with onshore. We have this and we are 100% owners. So, um, Victor, would love to hear your views. I would believe that your company might be a civil company or a sole trader. He's saying yes, civil. Okay, civil, yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think um, civil company is also, like I said, uh, uh, like it's, it's one of the options, but it's just that, you know, with civil companies, you don't have limited liability. So that's okay for while, during the period while a company is still small, but, you know, once you grow, uh, once your revenues Across a particular threshold, I would always encourage people to think about a limited liability company. Um, there's another comment by Faisal. 
he's mentioned that the 100% uh, onshore plan in the UAE has been going on since more than a decade. What makes you think that'll happen end of the year? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, good question. It's, you know, I also have the same thought, but, uh, you know, they've been talking about it for all the years, but they never really changed the laws. However, the last year, they've actually gone ahead and changed the UAE company's law. And that's a big thing because if the law tells you that you can actually have 100% ownership, then it's, you know, it, it's serious business. Uh, so I would say, you know, I'm, I'm waiting till the end of this month to see what are the T's and C's of, uh, you know, the implementation of this law. It's likely that maybe they might have certain, you know, capital requirements, or maybe, you know, you might have to employ, you might have certain emirat emiratization requirements. Um, but uh, at the same time, the UAE is very uh, keen on encouraging people to set up, uh, they're very keen on diversifying the, the business landscape. Uh, they do want to encourage people to come and set up in the UAE. And so I think, this time it might just mean serious business. We'll just have to wait for, like I said, uh, the end of this month. I think uh, Priyasha, before you take on more questions, because there are a few more questions, do you mind if we do the photo quickly right now before people need to leave for their hard stop? And then you can continue for a bit. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, perfect. Yeah, we can take a photo and then I can address the questions. Sure. I mean, so there are a few more mind, questions, so yeah. Yeah. If you don't mind, can you stop sharing the screen for a minute? Sure, 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 sure. Uh, okay, yeah. everyone, uh, if we can have whoever's comfortable with it, of course, if we can have your uh, videos on uh, so we can take a quick photo. Shouldn't ever miss a photo opportunity. I'll give everyone a minute. Gigi, good to see you. Uh, Reshmi, good to see you. Hi, Vinay. Mercy, Joffin, Elsa, Deepthi, Alta. It'll be a very boring uh, a photo without quite a few people. Thank you, Farhad. Brilliant. I'm going to click in three, two, one. Thank you, everyone. And over to you again, Priyasha. Sure. Okay, perfect. So, yeah, I think we have a question from uh, Monera. In your opinion, do you see any benefit from starting e-commerce business in UAE for the GCC residents? And if there is, can you explain? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I would say from a legal perspective, of course, uh, you know, if you're targeting the UAE, then you definitely need to have a legal entity in the UAE. Uh, but uh, from a commercial perspective, I would say, yeah, you need to take a call. It depends on the product that, you know, you're selling. Um, there are a lot of e-commerce businesses in, you know, in the GCC. So I think all, a lot of them are doing really well. So definitely you, you probably need to do a little bit of a market research based on the product that you're selling. It is challenging, of course, running a business, but uh, there are a lot of businesses flourishing in, in the region. Uh, there's another question from George. What all restrictions of a free zone company to deal with the mainland company? Doing meetings are not allowed, not working in premise providing resources. A good question, uh, George, if you're an e-commerce company, then typically what you're doing is you're providing an online service. So there's no restriction as such with you to deal with a mainland company. You can definitely have clients in the mainland. Uh, you can also actually even attend meetings. Uh, definitely attending meetings are not a problem. It's only if you're uh, sometimes, if you're working outside in another client's office, uh, on a more of a permanent basis, then you could sort of face, you could potentially face issues if you have a labor check, but attending meetings, that's not a problem. Also, there's nothing really stopping you from uh, taking up, uh, from working in a co-working space or a business center. So a lot of people, what they do is they set up their free zone company 
And then they actually work out of a business center in Dubai. So you can set up your free zone company in let's say Sharjah, you can, and you can actually work out of a business center in Dubai and that's perfectly okay. Uh, opening a bank account in the UAE is a bit difficult. Any insights? Yeah, so uh, a couple of years ago, yes, opening a bank account was difficult, uh, but now they have actually made it slightly easier. So it's still a bit challenging and it takes time. It takes about a month. Uh, but there are a couple of uh, options uh, which are which have started for startups. So there's uh, there's the Rack Starter Bank account. You can actually apply for it online. And there's also the Mashrik NeoBiz that's specifically meant for startups and SMEs. Um, so these are a couple of options that you can actually uh, uh, take advantage of if you want to open a bank account. Uh, and in the worst case scenario, if you can't open a bank account in the UAE, then you can try exploring setting up a, a bank account in Mauritius or in some other location. Uh, having said that, uh, in most cases, we've seen that our clients have been able to open a bank account. And if you ever face an issue, then you can just let us know and we can have a discussion and see how we can help you out. Uh, there's another comment by Fezal, oh, why give away stake to an advisor? That would be too much. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends. Sometimes uh, you have, uh, you know, if you have a really amazing mentor and you want to take their time, but you can't really pay them, uh, then you might want to give them, you know, a little bit of a stake just to uh, as consideration for, you know, the services that they're providing you and as, as a token of appreciation for their time. Uh, so that's something like certain startups do uh, because, you know, they have nothing else to give to an advisor because as a startup, you're pretty much uh, cash strapped. Another question is, can we transfer a civil to an LLC? Yes, uh, the DED, they do allow you to convert your civil company to an LLC. So um, that's a pretty straightforward option. Uh, you just have to sign a few documents uh, with the DED and you can convert your sole trader license or your civil company to an LLC. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, I think that's a pretty good option once your business grows. Uh, perfect. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to type in my uh, uh, email address here. Okay, there's another question by, sorry, by Rish, uh, Rishank. I haven't seen that. So uh, is there a fixed definition by the DED on what services an e-commerce service provider can provide or is, or is it undefined? Uh, I see a lot of platforms providing services and issuing payment receipts when in reality the services are provided by vendors. Um, yeah, so the thing about e-commerce companies is that, uh, you know, e-commerce companies, you're, a lot of e-commerce companies, they're not really selling a lot of goods, especially when it comes to products, uh, physical goods, they don't really sell the products themselves. Uh, it's being sold by a vendor. So the DED doesn't really care about, uh, especially if you're running an e-commerce company with portal activity, uh, they do recognize that you're not the seller of the goods. So, and you, you're also not meant to be the seller of the goods. You're only the IT platform. So it's absolutely fine to have an e-commerce company where you're not selling the goods. The services or the goods are being provided by somebody else. Uh, that's, a, that's the essence of e-commerce companies. Uh, even like, for example, things like Airbnb, uh, Zomato, they're all IT platforms. They're not really, prov uh, they're not really providing any of the products themselves. So that's absolutely fine. Um, the DDD is okay with that. A question by Reshmi is, uh, what's a typical sweat equity percentage offered by a startup? It actually is very difficult, it, 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 a question to answer. It really depends from startup to startup. Um, and but there are a couple of websites that you can actually uh, go to to uh, to help you understand, uh, you know, the average sweat equity that you might want to um, uh, that you might want to give to some of your co-founders. Uh, I don't really know that at the top of my head, but I can actually separately message you and I've actually used some of these websites myself. It all depends on what a person brings to the table. Right. 
Uh, and of course, uh, sometimes you're never going to get the perfect answer. So keep that in mind that there's never going to be a perfect uh, percentage that you can offer to your co-founder or to you know the people who work for you. It's a very difficult uh, task to understand to figure out the number. So don't waste too much time in in this process as well. Uh, can we use our ex existing bank accounts from our local countries that have branches in the UAE? Yes, Seth, Seth had this question. Yes, you can do that. I've seen a lot of companies do that. For example, they have a stand standard charter uh, bank account in their home country. So <clears throat> they just open, uh, they just ask standard charter to open another bank account for their company in the UAE. So you can definitely do that. Well, you mentioned a minimum threshold in dirhams. No, there's no minimum threshold as such for opening a bank account. It's only, what I meant is that, um, you know, sometimes uh, you need to have a minimum threshold before you consider, let's say having a limited liability company or before you wanna, before uh, let's say registering your logo. And, it, and I would say typically it would be like, 200 or 300 to 500,000 dirhams. And, and when your business gets more serious, then you want to have a limited liability company. I hope I answered your question because I'm not sure if I understood it correctly. Um, okay. Yeah, okay. So I'm having a look at the Q&A session as well, a Q&A chat. And I think you've anyways replicated the questions here. Uh, another question by Seth is drop shipping a viable business model that is accepted under GCC law. Um, yeah, that's absolutely fine. A lot of, in fact, there are so many businesses in the UAE where which are essentially drop shipping businesses. Because, like I said, you're uh, in a drop shipping business, you're just a platform and you're a marketing agency. So you're marketing other people's products. And, um, and essentially you will mention in your terms and conditions that I'm not the seller of the product. I am just the intermediary. Uh, there, there is somebody else who's gonna, be the, who's gonna be selling the product to you. I know there's a little bit of uh, thinking that you'll have to do while doing the terms and conditions, uh, but somewhere in your website, you'll have to mention uh, that you're not really the seller and you're more of an intermediary in drop shipping. But there are a lot of companies which actually do drop shipping in the UAE. Um, I'm just gonna quickly tell you that uh, I, I was actually launching a course uh, in April. And so if you'd like to, uh, you know, if, you like, if you'd like to know more about it, then we can have a quick chat. Uh, and you can contact me at Priyasha. I'm going to type my email ID here, priyasha.kori at connectedlaw.com. So in this masterclass, I'm actually going to be covering some of the basic business and legal framework in the UAE. And, it's, and I think it's probably going to be very useful to those who are especially new to the country. Uh, I'm going to be talking about, you know, how the legal, legal system works. The idea is for you to be a little more confident about how you can go about your business. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about how you can hire a team, uh, what are the agreements that you need to enter into, and I'm also gonna be providing you templates of employment agreements. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about contracting in the UAE, and here again, I'm gonna be sharing a few agreement templates with you, and I'm also gonna be taking you through them. I'll be talking to you about, um, I'll be, some of the templates that I'm going to be sharing are mutual NDAs, um, even co-founder agreements, um, employment agreements, and maybe terms and conditions and privacy policies as well. And I'll have a video taking you through each of those agreements. I'm also going to be talking about resolving disputes. A lot of people assume that resolving disputes is very complicated and expensive in the UAE but that's not really the case. You have a range of options and you can actually approach courts in a very cost-effective manner. So I work with a lot of lawyers who are cost-effective as well, especially litigation lawyers. So, um, yeah, you know, it's a misconception that resolving disputes always has to be expensive. And then of course, we're also gonna have a session. Uh, I'm also gonna be covering a few topics on accelerating your growth. Uh, I'm going to be talking about how you can build an ecosystem around yourself, how you can build your network in the UAE, 
um, some of my colleagues are going to discuss about how you can manage your cash flows, how you can outsource your accounting to experts. Um, so that's that's uh, so there's going to be a lot of value in this course. Uh, also, another benefit of this course, and it's a six week course. Uh, we're also going to have a weekly coaching calls where you know we quickly discuss your questions or any hurdles that you are facing. Um, we also have we're also going to have a private LinkedIn group where we can all share ideas and uh, discussions when we're not having our weekly coaching calls. Um, the bonus of this is that uh, we're gonna. Uh, I'm gonna also share you some some of my key contacts that I use, which are you know the banking contacts, uh, the accounting folks that you can actually work with for managing your accounts. There are certain local partners that you could use, especially in the UAE, if you want, if you need to have a 51% ownership. Uh, I'm going to, I could also share you, it's also going to have some of my contacts on with private notaries. And then of course, you can also join uh, our ecosystem. We have various, especially this is for professional services firms. We have an ecosystem where we, where you can uh, share your expertise with the rest of us. And we are more than happy to refer clients or opportunities to you as and when they arise. Uh, so if you're interested to know a little bit about the business masterclass, then shoot me an email and I'm happy to share the details or set up a call and take you through it. Um, I know we're running, uh, we, you know, we don't really have much time, but I'll probably just take one last question before we end. Uh, one of the questions is, can you highlight a few more free zone areas? Uh, I would say, you know, the Northern Emirates are pretty much, uh, you know, they're almost the same, you know, so you're, uh, to be honest, you just have to look out for what's the best offer that you get at any given point in time. I would say Sharjah is good, Rack is good. Um, and these are the two Emirates that you can basically consider for your company, Sharjah and Rack. Um, Dubai also is actually now coming up with cost-effective options. So previously you could never set up a free zone company in Dubai you all, without an office space. You always needed an office space. But over the last year, there are a couple of new free zones that have come about, like the Kick Labs that's based in Queen Elizabeth II. And you also have the IFSA, which is based in Dubai Silicon Oasis. So there you can set up a company with, with a virtual office space and you can actually have a Dubai based free zone. It's, uh, it's, it's still slightly more expensive than Sharjah, but uh, it, it, you, know, you, you still have the option of, of a virtual office space. And so you don't really need to splurge on having an office. So setting up in Dubai also has become cost effective. Okay, perfect. You know, I think uh, we've, uh, uh, you know, we've taken quite a lot of time and we've gone beyond um, 11. So if you have any further questions, what I would encourage you to do is to shoot me an email. Uh, thank you very much for attending today's session. Uh, I really appreciate your time. Um, I really look forward to interacting with all of you and happy to, you know, get onto a call with you separately post the session. Okay, thanks a lot, everyone. Um, I'm now going to exit. Thank you, Priyasa. Priyasha. Yeah, bye. Thank you, Priyasha. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Bye.